Yeah, I am here, yeah. Great, okay, well, welcome. Uh, very good to, to see you. And the floor is yours. Yeah. Uh, okay, thank you very much. And uh, let me start with expressing my deep feeling of, uh, you know, of shame and humiliation that all of this uh, entire Putin Russians do feel since the February 24th of this year. And that is, uh, and my big uh, sympathies to everybody uh, who fell victim already of uh, the uh, Putin's aggression in Ukraine. This is something that I'm probably the only participant of this conference still uh, being in, situated in, in, in Russia, inside St. Petersburg, and you can feel that is not a, um, not a pleasant place to be right now. But I will, but I will uh, tell you not uh, anything uh, about the war itself, uh, certainly not about the events in Ukraine. I want to discuss the uh, situation with um, one of the important debate which took place in the uh, well in the expert uh, publications in the social media in, uh, in 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 media in you know in media and uh, uh, in, in the private conversations and that is a uh, debate about the uh, support of of war support of uh, war in Russian society uh, again, I am not uh, here to speak about the, or to argue about the figures, about the numbers. And uh, since we have Margarita Zavatsky in our panel, who did more research exactly on that, probably she will, you know, I know that her presentation today is not about that, but I know she knows better than I do. But what is interesting for me, what I want uh, you to, you know, what I want to attract your attention to is that uh, the, uh, well, uh, is the situation when uh, people uh, divided into big, not even uh, groups, uh, immediately after the start of the war, in their judgment about the Russian society, you know, within the, you know, probably from the day one of February twenty-four, or maybe in the first several days after the start of aggression, uh, some people uh, were sure that Russian people are supportive of what is going on, of what Mr. Putin was doing. And another people, another group of people immediately uh, started to argue against that. It was uh, happened even before the first uh, public opinion polls results were published. And certainly when they started to appear, uh, the debate took uh, the form of debating whether the uh, public opinion polls relevant, can we, can we trust them or, or we, we, we don't. Uh, we shouldn't uh, trust the polls during the war time. So that uh, that debate about the uh, real attitude of, of Russians to, to the war is going on and it's still not over. Uh, and uh, my interest is why people were from the very beginning, again, even before any data or any uh, anything that can be you know, can can serve as a proof, as a as a, uh, can be trusted. Uh, started to argue, and why people uh, continue to defend the positions even when some proofs were uh, did, did appear. And uh, I would say that, from my point of view and from my uh, vision of what is was going on in the debate, uh, is that uh, people uh, based their judgment on the biases which they acquired well before this year, before this war. And we do know that there are uh, big groups of uh, Russians on the one uh, side, and on the one hand, uh, Russian intelligentsia, well, Russian experts, uh, wider, uh, wider uh, straight of Russian opinion makers. Uh, that uh, do believe that uh, Russian people are not uh, ready for democracy. That is a, one uh, pretty uh, pretty widespread opinion about Russians. And that was, you know, we can try, we can trace uh, this type of attitude to Russia well back, like to 100 years ago, to Vichy, you know, to the publications after the first Russian revolutions and to Gershon Zone. Uh, warning that if uh, Russian people will get a democracy, they, uh, that will first uh, kill and first come for your intellectuals. And so all the Russian intellectuals should trust the state as a last uh, defense from the 
you know, uh, from the uh, from the public uh, public aggression. And there is also certainly the other group of uh, Russian, uh, well, Russian intellectuals who do believe that Russian people can uh, build uh, some, you know, democratic institutions that sh should not be feared of. But uh, what is going on is that uh, Russian institutions were destroyed by the state, but this is a problem of the state institution building and not the problem of the people, which is, you know, which, which is too aggressive and too uh, war, war like. And we can see it uh, among the Russian politicians as well. We see that people like Navalny or Yashin do believe that the people is, uh, can be trusted or people, people are not as, as bad as the other part of, of the Russian television. Uh, describing that. And that uh, division uh, was, was obvious when you read the uh, Russian, uh, Russian domestic debates uh, in the 90s and especially since 2000, year 2000. And of course, after February 24 of this year, it's, uh, you know, uh, the, the debate was re re revived and uh, reinforced by the event. You know, those who uh, always de defended the idea that the Russian people is uh, aggressive by, by definition, that what Putin was doing is something that uh, the Russian people wanted from him. From him. Uh, they, they, they got the, uh, immediately the position that this is a war of, of Russian people. This is not the war of Kremlin, not the war of Putin. It's a war of Russian people because Russian people, as we always thought, uh, uh, we were thinking about it, uh, was, a, uh, was an aggressive, imperialistic, and wants to, uh, to and, and never, never thinks about uh, other people as, uh, well, as, as somebody they, they, they should keep... Uh, they should keep esteem or tolerance too. And of course, uh, those who always defended the, well, the possibility of Russian people agency and those, those who always believe that the Russian people can be, uh, can uh, participate in the institution building, uh, well, try to, to counter this position. And we have seen that as a essence of the debate about who believed Levada Center and who did not believe the Levada Center, uh, figures we are uh, split at almost the same in the same proportion, so it's the same uh, personal uh, personal uh, combination as the debate before before 2022. In the United States, uh, there is also several traditions of uh, judging about Russian people. Well, well, getting back also like about 100 years, uh, and there is tradition which uh, consider Russia as an immutable country immutable and uh, well which re, uh, um, which keeps uh, the basic of its political and so and social construction uh, in, intact uh, through the um, maybe from medieval ages until now and that is something which uh, well uh, some historians influential historians did uh, describe in their writings okay I can just uh, mention Richard Pipes uh, as a person who who was a uh, who, who made a lot of, in, in this uh, in this direction? Who made a big impact on the on the on this way of thinking about Russian people? And there is also the other tradition which go back to the uh, American Society of the Friends of Russian Freedom. That was such an uh, organization for several decades since the late 19th, early 20th centuries. And that was an idea that okay, we have a, there is a somewhere good Russian people suppressed by the bad Russian state, and that uh, American. Americans who are interested in the Russian future should help Russian, good Russian people to get rid of the bad Russian state. And this is an, another tradition which also uh, alive. We can, we can trace uh, this type of a debate. Of course, this is a scheme, very schematic, but uh, we can see this type of a debate in American media until this year. Certainly in 2022, uh, we can imagine uh, which side got more argument to, to support uh, their position, but still it's, it's, it, it is there. And again, this uh, all Sorry, forms more. And it all for can can you hear me? Sorry. So, uh, if I was just just interrupting, unfortunately, so you got about a minute and a half to pick up. Uh, yeah, I'm. Uh, yeah, I'm finishing it. So sorry. If, if I, 
I'm not sure you 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 hear me. And that's is yeah. I, I I come to the to to to, to the final uh, point. So my my conclusion is not uh, to to argue in favor of uh, of one of the opinions, but my uh, my my understanding uh, is that uh, what we have is a construction of uh, ex external construction, construction made by experts both in Russia and outside of Russia. <laughs> Uh, uh, of uh, the Russian, of so-called of Russian people and what Russian people was thinking. Uh, my understanding is that uh, majority of Russians just uh, do not have uh, relevant language to express what they think about the war. And that language is uh, produced for them by propaganda, of course, and produced for them by opposition figures, which are, of course, much less, uh, has much less uh, approach, less uh, ways to, to communicate their opinion. Uh, but uh, this is a, a matter not of the research as much, uh, but the matter of the construction of that opinion. And uh, when the person, well, like on the street, those who uh, respond to Levada Center or other polling station, uh, need to formulate some idea about the war, about, the, uh, well, about what is going on, it's actually rely to the language they know, and they know mostly the propaganda language. And that is why I do think that it makes sense in the, uh, especially if you think about long-term consequences, uh, to uh, help to construct the Russian uh, people, uh, which is, uh, which is ready for institution building, which is anti-war. And this is this language uh, constructed by intellectuals, uh, both in Russia and uh, in, uh, in the United States, is a formative, you know, shaping, can, can, can serve as a shaping uh, the future of, of uh, Russian self-understanding, you know, at, at the moment, at least at the moment after the propaganda falls and uh, the regime will change. Otherwise, we see that if uh, the people have a propaganda now and then the propaganda disappears, they go to the expert opinion, which, which says actually the same thing. That when the experts say to the, to the person the same thing that propaganda does, you know, you are always supported Putin, you are imperialistic, you are uh, okay. If there is the only language available, people will uh, shape, will find their own identity within this type of uh, with this type of understanding. So from my point of view, it's not just about research. This discussion, which I described, which is not just about the research, it's all also about the construction of the future. And that is, uh, I think, the important political uh, implication for what I, I, I tried to say. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ivan. Okay. And then, uh, Well, well, thank you very much uh, for Bernard for inviting me. Uh, today I'll be discussing back a little bit. I'll be discussing about the North Caucasus and the impact of the war in Ukraine on uh, the impact of the war in Ukraine on the North Caucasus. So, in a way. I'm trying to explain in this policy memo. Um, in the last couple of weeks, in the last couple of months, we have described the North Caucasus as powder keg really, really ready to explode, where the dissolution or the end of the Putin administration or Russia would start within the North Caucasus. Uh, the protest in Mashkala, the protest in Nalshik recently about the mobilization said the idea that the North Caucasus is ripe for a revolution, ripe for a massive mobilization, 
that would lead to the domino theory where other ethnicities and nationalities in Russia would fall. Um, what I'm trying to explain in a policy memo is that it is very reminiscent of the way we see the Soviet Union in the 1980s. That the, the end of the Soviet Union could only come from Central Asia, uh, from the impact of the Afghan War, and so on. Um, I'm explaining here that the North Caucasus is changing a lot because of the war in Ukraine, but at the same time, it is very apocalyptic in a way to see the North Caucasus as a to explode, as a major liability for internet, internal stability for Russia. I suggest that by looking at the change in the balance of power in the North Caucasus, by looking at um, mobilization in the North Caucasus, as well as discussing of what is left of the insurgency in Chechnya and the North Caucasus, we can produce a more complex and nuanced understanding of the North Caucasus. The North Caucasus is right now in a phase of changing, but at the same time, uh, let's remind us that in the last 10 years, uh, for oh, several thousand of people already left the North Caucasus for Turkey, uh, for Syria, for the EU, for Ukraine. So this idea of massive exodus of people from Russia is something that the North Caucasus has experiment already for a long, long period, resulting from corruption, from uh, economic uh, struggle, as well as harsh religious and political repression in Chechnya and in the North Caucasus. So the North Caucasus is based on the war uh, in Ukraine, simply adapting to a new reality, a reality where uh, colonial Russia is challenged from the outside. Let's uh, remind everyone um, that Chechnya was probably the first decolonialism of the post-Soviet era where we discussed this morning about Ukrainian resilience. Um, Chechen resilience is 15 to 20 years of resistance against the Russian army, a major conventional military victory against the Russian army um, without or with very minimal support from the West. And the decay or the end of a fairly democratic process that was going on in Chechnya. In other words, when we talk about decolonization uh, or the end of colonial and imperial Russia, Chechnya and, and the North Caucasus stand in a weird position. Stuck within Russian sovereignty, not in the same position as Ukraine, but really asking what is next for the North Caucasus and following what is happening in Ukraine. Each discussion about Ukraine right now leading or facing Russia is something that the North Caucasus experiment um, almost 20 years ago. <laughs> so three ways to understand it. First, power dynamics in the North Caucasus. In the last year, we have seen Ramzan Kedarov really rising within the political system in Russia. From the beginning of the war, uh, in Ukraine, where Ramzan Kedira played a, a very important role, from massive creation of volunteer battalions to support the war, and forced mobilization of Chechen very early on. So even before the mobilization, you had uh, Chechnya leading the way all across. So in a way, Ramzan Kedira, rather than looking inward in the Caucasus, to fight and expand its power in Ushikar Dagestan is moving into federal politics along its inner circle. So the, uh, this, this leads to very different dynamics. The Kadarovsis are now rising into federal politics and within the war in Ukraine. We have seen them very active on social media, promoting their activities in Bobatna, particularly in Mariupol and Sibelius and F where uh, they played the reconstruction part, but also the role as military forces. Uh, 
before the beginning of the long term Kenya was outside of Russian national. With the war in Ukraine, they have entered along the Wagner group within the narrative of the leading force into the war. Uh, Kedera was able to frame the role of Kedera as the uh, power militia, forgetting the failure of Kiev, the failure of what happened in Bucha, for example, and reframing the success of recent military operation. If Kedera is moving away from the North Caucasus, it leads to North Caucasus in a uh, new balance of power with other actors, including Sergei Milikov and Dagestan, um, is trying to get more momentum. So, in terms of stability, it is less about how much they want to confront Moscow than how much they want to share and compete for power within the North Caucasus. At the Okay, uh, uh, I'll try to go fast. We have seen extremely heavy political mobilization in the recent days in Pakistan, in an also confronting uh, the idea of uh, mobilization from the top. Um, this is a changing nature in the North Caucasus, but at the same time, uh, Dagestan is not yet organized within a very Vertical organization of political program. Uh, the heavy death toll uh, of Dagestan combined with the force mobilization is creating right condition for mobilization to happen to a bigger level. But at the same time, what we are seeing right now are organic, horizontal, limited elements of mobilization. It should be wrong to perceive that as a movement that would challenge the federal uh, control over the North Caucasus. Remember something, Russia has nothing to do with the North Caucasus now. It's not part of the European Court of Human Rights anymore. Um, it is already under strong uh, Western sanction, and Kenderov is playing a role somewhere else. For all those reasons, we don't see right away at um, our mobilization at a disorganized level can move into a, pro, a movement that would challenge uh, the control of Moscow in the North Caucasus. Quick, and I have one minute to talk about that. What about the renewed insurgency in the North Caucasus? We've seen a lot on social media about uh, a new Shamil, uh, Imam Shamil Battalion, uh, Ichkir, the sons of Ichkiria. We have seen about mobilization discussed a lot inside the diaspora in, um, in Europe and in Turkey. At the same time, Logistically, there is nothing existing to support an insurgency in the North Caucasus. No transit route to support uh, insurgents. There is no uh, real support for the insurgency, nationalist or uh, Islamists right now in the region. And overall, there's no recruitment or structure that would be able to jumpstart an insurgent. Does it mean it will not happen? The fighters from the North Caucasus have been connecting. Uh, a lot with um, with Ukrainian soldiers, the Ukrainian army, and I'll come to it in a second. However, we still don't know how momentum of decolonization, mobilization, and uh, insurgency can move from Ukraine to the North Caucasus. Adding to that, the jihadism or jihadist forces that were riding in Ukraine, Turkey, and Western Europe have been extremely silent with regard to what to do with the colonization and the fight against Russia in the North Caucasus. They stayed away of the war in Ukraine. They don't they didn't mobilize so far. So it remains a major question mark. I'll take 50 seconds, oh maybe 45 seconds for that. What does it mean for the European Union and the United States? First of all, it is the moment to support a movement of human rights. In the development of democracy in the North Caucasus, something that was dropped in the 1990s and never really supported after the beginning of the war there. Second thing, North Caucasian people are not ethnic Russian. A lot of them are right now being treated as if they are pro-war and expelled from European countries because Russia has put a red notice on them, because they are perceived as Russian citizens and so on, or not even being able to access Georgia. 
the modernization of North Carolina will not support the development of human rights and democracy over again. It doesn't mean that the US or European Union should support independent and nationalist claims in Chechnya, Dagestan, or other regions. It means that protests connected to the decolonization movement should be supported outside of Ukraine. And this is probably where the US and the European Union is facing, walking what they are talking about. The idea that it's not only about the geopolitical game in Ukraine, but a broader movement of independence, democratic rights, uh, human rights at the regional level in Russia, which the North Caucasus has been the center of with regard to the federal government. Since the 1990s, the level of human rights abuses has been extremely high in the North Caucasus and not taken as seriously compared to what we think right now in Ukraine and what the US government is doing right now. Thank you very much, and I apologize for the much. All right, both panels. Okay, well, first of all, I'm delighted to be here uh, and I will share some updates on the post memo uh, I wrote with my colleagues some time ago. It's uh, on the uh, anti war wave of Russian migrants, the big exodus that we observed during the last uh, six months. So, and I will just give some additional numbers. But before I do that, so let me express my deepest sympathy and my. Ukrainian colleagues in France, so my family is also from the Ukrainian background, and we were looking at that situation. And um, I actually um, admire the bravery and devotion of my Ukrainian colleagues, what they're doing at the moment. And the last time I attended the Ponars events in, in Latin person actually was in 2017, and now the university is destroyed, like completely destroyed. And this is this is a big tragedy, and I feel I think most uh, Panarsians, unfortunately, had experience for themselves. Well, this story, actually, the way I, I'm trying to lay out, so it's not a normative interpretation that these are the good versions to escape the war. It's nothing like that. So, since it's really hard for me to establish any reasonable distance from the data, since I'm not sure, of course, imposes a lot of uh, biases and it doesn't allow me. Um, to kind of you know look at these numbers as person white coat and uh, a lab coat and uh, to interpret them absolutely <clears throat> as objectively as possible. So I will be hiding my emotions under behind the numbers, <laughs> and I will be very grateful for you to give any uh, feedback or any alternative interpretations. I also try to come up with some potential policy implications of what we've observed so far. And since we're still in the uh, at the very end of the data collection, so I managed with my colleagues to kind of compile some interesting, hopefully interesting comparison between the first and the second wave of Russian migrants, and actually maybe some of the numbers will speak for themselves to the extent as possible. But we also know that numbers is not the objective reality; they can also be used as a weapon, especially as uh, Russian surveys have been used so far, uh, also as a part of the Russian state propaganda. So this is why I also let you just you know kind of uh, ask you to treat this number with uh, with caution. But anyway, uh, let me proceed. So just some background information. I'm pretty sure that it's not in this room. Uh, everybody is quite aware of what's going on. So more than at least three hundred thousand Russians fled. So we can assume right after the Russian government launched this failed invasion of Ukraine. Um, there are three main features that differentiate this wave from previous uh, waves of Russian uh, in the case. So it's not the first wave. We know that there were different uh, immigration uh, migration waves that happened after the collapse of the Soviet Union during uh, 
Soviet times, such in the 70s and, and early 80s when the, the Jewish uh, migrations and so on. But there are three different features that actually uh, make this people, this group of people, quite diverse from, from previous years. First of all, they are uh, highly qualified uh, employees, specialists, uh, a share of people with academic degrees, and a share of people who are employed in the very competitive industry is disproportionately higher compared to the rest of the population in Russia. I think it's not a big secret here, but this is something that is kind of, you know, uh, um, is quite drastic, so, and uh, it's quite obvious. And then about one third of them are employed in IT industry, not necessarily those who do programming, but also people who are doing some marketing services and who are well trained and actually they are have very um, mobile skills in the labor markets. And of course, the threat migration will affect labor markets in the destination countries. So I think it's also quite obvious. And finally, they are really, really politicized. And this is very unusual. They also share an enormous degree of trust to each other, which is also not typical for uh, the most of the Russian population, since it also bears led to the post communist authoritarian states when interpersonal trust and institutional trust is extremely low. This is not the case. These people tend to trust each other much more than those Russians who stay in the country for obvious reasons. And they also tend to trust the governments of the countries where actually they are staying at the moment. So, this is basically a uh, the, uh, maybe some starting points uh, of, of, for our big project. So, uh, we carried out an online panel survey. A uh, panel survey actually allows us not just to ask people what, how they feel and what the attitude is. It also actually allows us to keep track where they are and actually to what extent their actions and their trajectory diverge from what they actually say. So, of course, we know there's a lot of desirability bias going on uh, in both sides. So, Russians inside the country are afraid to speak their minds because we have an opinion. We don't really know. Um, or we have pretty limited knowledge about that. So, and those who are outside, they also kind of, uh, they know the right words. They know how to actually uh, kind of frame their decisions. So, that's not an economic migration, it's a political migration. And actually, I think it's quite meaningless and it's not very relevant to try to differentiate whether this, this migration wave is uh, due to more mostly political reasons like they're really good people or it's about it's all about the economy because they're smart people. It's really hard to disentangle. So I think it's not the right place to discuss that. So I mean let's just focus on the facts of other people are and what they actually what they do. Of course the panel data have their own uh, biases and disadvantages. So there is a lot of uh, problems caused by the attrition bias because people are moving around so much that it's really Hard to keep track on every single individual, but we still managed to actually keep at least half of our sample. And we also tried to add new, yeah, new, uh, new people and respondents uh, to the sample actually to keep the project going. So, so far we have two waves. Okay, this is the batch of human signal. Right. And uh, the third wave is scheduled on uh, for December, January. So, and of course, we're going to have completely different people from the from these two ways, uh, most of the males who are escaping the uh, conscription. Okay, so let me give you some numbers. So uh, the people who escaped the war, they are younger, wealthier, wealthier, and more educated. So here in the blue bars, you see the um, feature statistics for the overall population of Russia, and in the no, in the blue bars is those Russians who migrated, sorry for some, some titles, and the gray bars show uh, the uh, statistics for the rest of the population. So this is quite actually uh, confirms our uh, our um, expectations, so, so to speak. So uh, if we compare the first and the <coughs> second wave of migrants, actually there is not so many differences between them. So uh, maybe the main conclusion we can we can make and can draw is that the second wave mostly includes families with kids. So it took a bit longer for these. Russians to leave the country because it's politically more complicated. So maybe so far this is the biggest difference in terms of politicization, political activism, uh, political attitudes are pretty much the same. We didn't find any dramatic differences. Um, and of course, what is super relevant is that to what extent the citizens participate uh, and will actually remain active when it comes to the uh, Russian domestic politics. Maybe they just left for good and they will never return. And quite I mean, quite bother. Uh, on the other hand, so these people uh, reveal all kinds of uh, features that they are capable of maintaining and building up the something or communities or commons, 
Origins movement really is calling them. And uh, actually, they quite active and even got more activated and more politicized, finding themselves in the new, uh, in new countries and new societies. So, and let me just give you some uh, last numbers, some, some last slides with statistics. So, most of our respondents uh, are in Turkey, about 25% of our sample. Then comes Georgia, then the big category of random countries uh, under the label other. Armenia, much less than Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan. Of course, these numbers will, will change uh, in a month quite dramatically. And we will have more people in Kazakhstan and other countries because we do not require entry visas. Um, well, and of course, what we try to look at is that is there any possibility for uh, to voice political grievances after immigration? So, and let me just maybe very briefly uh, show the main findings we have so far. It's a statistics. But we have much more, so it's really hard to kind of conquer and, and, and to share the information in, in, in 10 minutes. So uh, those who have been act, politically active before the war, they remain active. They did not dis uh, disengage from politics. That's the first conclusion. And the level of activities and politicization remains the same. Um, this is the comparison uh, before the war and after the war. Then the next slide actually shows uh, whether these people tend to dis disengage after migration because immigration is also pretty costly enterprise, right? So that requires a lot of effort, time, and energy. So, and what we found out is that there is much more volunteering. So people remain active, people remain compassionate, and they remain empathetic, especially if they actually have more opportunity to help Ukrainian refugees. This is something which is also kind of a, a socially desirable and expected, and we actually see that this number actually has doubled compared to the previous wave. So actually, this is something that people are engaging much more actively at the moment. Um, and finally, there are some interesting correlates that uh, males tend to be much less uh, active and comfortable in hearing and helping Ukrainian refugees, especially those employed in the IT sector or industry. But there, is, there are some interesting gender dynamics that we observe. We do not have a very consistent information for this so far because these numbers are quite new. But these are some very simple regression plus uh, we have at the moment for different kinds of activities, helping migrants, helping Ukrainian refugees, and so on. And just main takeaway points, I wanted to uh, kind of conclude my very, maybe, rush through the numbers, but uh, this is so far what we have. So first of all, migration is a political protest. So it's not just people escaping from politics. They remain engaged. It's something which is actually quite counterintuitive for me. The second one is a uh, point is that this is a long term immigration. We try to see how many people came back to Russia. It's actually the person, uh, the, the percentage is, is pretty low. Uh, finally, previous experience of activism, especially experience spoken to repression, makes people more politicized and more active. This is something also not very usual, but very common because usually the more repression we have, the less activism we do have in the end. So that's not really the case here. People actually remain, take advantage of the democratic infrastructures in the destination countries and try to capitalize or take advantage and kind of remain more active. And finally, um, some maybe takeaway points in terms of, of, of policy, uh, if I may share some of the uh, ideas I have. So what is really important just to allow these people to maintain ties with those of in Russia because migration is a privilege. Only those who have money, education, and uh, resources can do that. So there are still people inside who don't really know how many, and it's really important to actually keep some kind of remittances or exchanges ongoing. That bridging the anti-war communities together and at least not creating, I do not insist on actually providing special infrastructure privileges to people, but at least not creating additional obstacles. Because these people are resourceful enough to help themselves. As I showed in my previous slides, they do, they do not believe that they are entitled. To any privilege. We also ask them uh, during our interviews, but at the same time, they also concerned if they have to face additional migration obstacles and so on. So, this is something I wanted to share. Let me stop here and thank you so much for your attention. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Thank you very much for those three very timely articles and papers. Uh, I think we're going to just I'm just going to briefly talk about the papers as a whole, and I think we want to get to the discussion as fast as possible. 
So I'm sure a lot of people have some questions and comments as well. But I found it very revealing that in the discussion of the caucuses, in the discussion of the caucuses, that we should not basically see the caucuses in the same lens as we looked at the collapse of the Soviet Union. That these are very different times, they are different variables, and that we shouldn't necessarily see that the caucuses will necessarily be in the lead of the change of the Russian Federation. Now, whether the recent events in Dagestan and other ethnic republics do foretold a change in the, the structure of the Russian Federation and to what extent the Russian Federation can survive uh, all these protests within the, uh, the caucuses is an open question. I'd like to thank Margarita for basically highlighting the question of who is leading the Russian Federation. And in terms of their skills, their experiences, it is clear that even before the mobilization, the best people were leaving. And it's the people who Russia needs uh, to create a different future, which Ivan was talking about, are the people that are leaving. So it is a very important question as to who remains in Russia and what their interaction and contact with the Russian Federation will be. But I want to focus mainly on Ivan's uh, presentation and the question about whether there is a liberal future uh, in, Russia's, in, in Russia. And he talked about the Yeki arguments and the debate within Yeki about the 1905 revolution and whether it was uh, what, what failed in the 1905 revolution and what went wrong, but it was very interesting that the debate in that Ivan sees is really kind of stuck in a very old, almost centuries old debate as to whether, whether Russia can, can change. And again, the debate about Vyeki was all about the intellectuals and intellectuals feeling that the 1905 revolution uh, after six years had been a complete failure and that they needed to turn to other more spiritual uh, arguments. And also the essay that was the most outside the collection of Vyeki articles was the uh, article by Bogdan Kistikovsky, a Ukrainian who talked about the need for the rule of law and the need for a change of legal consciousness. And clearly this is also something that is a very long debate and one that has not ended uh, just because of the collapse of the Soviet Union. I do want to talk about the one variable that uh, Ivan briefly mentions in his policy brief. And that is, there is an attempt, I think, right now, and Ivan talks about this, to make a distinction between the army and the war in Ukraine, and in particular, between what has transpired in terms of the atrocities in Ukraine. In other words, there is a new question in light, in, in, in this instance, and, and that is whether we can separate the war crimes and atrocities that have occurred in Ukraine um, and separate that from, uh, to, uh, from the entire Russian population as a whole. And I wrestle with these issues every day when I hear from my Russian and Ukrainian colleagues. But we are not at the end of the Cold War, but we have to deal now with war crimes, crimes of aggression and atrocities that are the equivalent, essentially, of Nuremberg. And so the question as to how Russia and the rest of the world deal with these war crimes is a very important to go. It's quite clear that unlike at the end of the Cold War, there is no memorial of these that's been shut down for the present time. So Russians will no longer cannot, cannot really address these issues. So we will have to deal somehow with, the, with who can actually deal with the war crimes that have occurred in Russia. And finally, I think Ivan talked about the question about integration 
and the need for integration still for uh, the, the attempt of integration for Russia after the end of the Cold War. I think in light of the decisions by President Putin to leave basically all of the post-Cold War institutions, including the Council of Europe, the European Court of Human Rights, uh, the OECD, uh, a whole host of different organizations, that it will be very difficult to make the argument that Russia can return to integration until these uh, war crimes have been addressed. Finally, the final question, which is also a historical question, is what unifies Russia going forward? I think that's still an open question, and we'll have some developments going forward. Sam. Thank you very much. Um, food for thought on a lot of a lot of fronts. Um, let's uh, open it up to uh, to the audience. Take questions. So, what can you write on your hand? First, let's collect two or three, and then we'll take it back to the audience. Will's comments. Do I need uh, a microphone? So, if not, um, I don't know. Is this being broadcast online? I have no idea. Yeah, it is. Okay. Um, for Yvonne, and this also touches on uh, migration, is um, could you comment on Putin's notion that this war is leading to a healthy cleansing of Russia, the elements that he doesn't want, that is, those who oppose him? Um, so he sees this as a way of consolidating Russia and actually welcomes the migration of people and the uh, turning in of others who will just basically keep their mouths shut. Um, that, that whole notion, which goes back to 2014, he raises first during when he announced the annexation of Crimea about the national, um, the, the traders and the, the national traders and, um, and the others. And, uh, but it's, it's really come to the fore now. With regard, and then I also have a, a Jean-Francois is, um, on the North Caucasus, could you comment, because it's not, a, a, your memo, I think, was written before the mobilization, and so could you comment about the protests in Dagestan, and then also the decision by Kadyrov to keep Chechnya um, exempt from the mobilization? Um, I, By the way, I have a much more skeptical view of the role of Chechnya in, in this war, in that uh, you know, there's been a lot of show of the Chechens who have taken part, and they take, you know, they post their uh, their photographs on Telegram and and do other things. But um, but there there have been comments posted by other Russians um, who've been taking part, saying that the Chechens really aren't doing anything. And so, if you could comment on that, and in fact that they have been costly because they've been disclosing information online that has allowed the Ukrainians to target was his battle. Thanks. And actually, just right behind you. You can introduce yourself. Sorry, that was Mark Bamber from Harvard. I'm Bill Mallet from Pop from the National Endowment for Democracy. Uh, my question is also for Jean Francois. Um, I agree with your recommendation um, about uh, expanding resources for better human rights advocacy, human rights protection in the North Caucasus. I'm just wondering. Um, what is your assessment of kind of the capacity for global civil society or even national and international civil society to work on that issue? Um, you know, over the last uh, several years, um, a lot of the, the human rights NGOs and other NGOs based in North Caucasus have been shut down, and larger national level NGOs like Memorial Committee Against Torture are less able to work there if at all. Um, so I'm wondering, you know, what you think in practical terms can be done on that issue? Thank you. Um, let's go here in the middle and we'll go over this side. So the hand right. Hello, thank you. My name is Anisha Osbeck and I'm a student here at the Elliott School and my question is for Margarita. First of all, this is a very interesting study. Thank you for sharing. But to John Francois, Francois's point, there is a strong tendency to categorize North Caucasia on indigenous peoples as simply Russian. And with that, I have a question about your map. In interviewing people, do you chart people's self-identification in terms of their ethnic backgrounds or simply with their nationality? And if you did or didn't, what was the reason behind that? Thank you. 
Actually, there's a, there's a lot of stuff over there. So I saw your hand, and I think a couple of others over here. So I will come back to you after answered. Uh, why don't we go in the order of the presentation? So, Yvonne, do uh, you want to address Mark's question? Anything else? Okay, yeah, I'm here, sorry. Uh, thank you, thank you, Will, for your comments and thank you for your, uh, well, uh, you mentioned this uh, problem of the future, dealing with the past, dealing with the uh, crimes, during uh, war crimes, and uh, and of course, uh, Russia will face this, uh, and, well, international community and, and Russia, because I'm speaking from Russia and speaking about Russia, will, <laughs> We need to 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 deal to with with the crimes, with the war crimes, with the uh, atrocities that you mentioned, and that is uh, inevitable, and that is that will that will come. And of course, this is a part of the uh, of well of the future of the future institutional building in Russia. Uh, still, I do uh, believe that uh, the problem that I address here is uh, can be. Uh, well, can be studied, uh, well, not, not quite separately. It's not, you cannot separate the war with different parts of the of the war, but I should say that uh, the knowledge about the mass atrocities uh, is, is a, uh, not, well, not known or uh, people deny this type of information uh, major, uh, because it's, uh, this is a language that they cannot accept. And that is, something that should be part of the uh well in the long run it should be part of maybe in the medium range uh prospect it should be should be addressed and that is exactly part of the uh of this reinvention reconstruction of the uh of the russian people you know how much uh well how much publications now again in the social media in uh, independent media uh, are now about the like, German experience from the again from the day one from uh, February 24 people started to to publish to to lecture about how Germans did uh, overcome the Nazi uh, Nazi past and that was a, that is a part important part of the of the discussion in this anti-Putin uh, segment of Russian society of course but that is something which which uh, uh, well this part of Russian society is concerned very much about uh well uh and that's uh, you mentioned that that there was an integration of russia uh with putin well and you mentioned that putin was integrated that was exact exactly what was uh, the case uh the personal integration of mr putin is was not an integration of russia we just today learned the story that european union european commission actually uh is considering uh to include into seventh uh, sanction, uh, seven uh, group of sanction, uh, the police equipment like tear gas and this uh, all of the stuff that supported. Well, that actually used always was used by regime to to suppress the protest. So it's still not there. The European Union already punished all the Russians, but it did not punish uh, the government. Uh, I mean, did not prevent the uh, the government from receiving the police equipment, which the, which it, it it used against protesters. So uh, it uh, this personal integration does not work, and of course, it's not something we uh, we need to 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 expect and we need to 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 hope for. It's a, I, I was speaking about different uh, type of integration. It's not exactly the top, the theme of, of of this of my policy memo, memo. But this is something I'm thinking well and, and writing uh, somewhere else uh, a lot about. And I do think that that one of the problems uh, of Russia, of this Russian resentment, if you can use this word for for Russia, was this uh, exclusion of Russia from uh, from Europe after 1991. So I do believe, well, it's not uh, an attempt to escape responsibilities. Of course, the responsibility of Russian elites, of uh, the Russian government is, is uh, extremely big. But uh, if we also have to discuss what can be done differently from the Western part, 
we do need to think about the lack of uh, integration of Russia. But again, this is not the topic of my today's presentation. Mark, uh, yes, uh, it's a good uh, addition. Yeah, exactly, Putin, uh, it's probably one of the reasons why the uh, Russian borders are still open, not for everybody during mobilization, but still open. They, uh, they are, uh, you know, welcome the exodus of uh, anti-Putin people. People are running away, and that is something which makes uh, the police system, uh, you know, less uh, well under less pressure. But it's also uh, the well. On the other hand, even the big, the great number of uh, people escaping from mobilization this uh, last week, uh, and uh, well, and those all, all of the people who immigrated this year since February. Well, I don't know exactly exact figures, hundreds of thousands, as far as I understand, uh, still uh, the uh, small numbers compared to the number of people who stayed, including uh, those anti-Putin Russians who are staying in Russia for many reasons, for personal circumstances and for like principal uh, reasons. You know, there are uh, much more, I, I, I should say, I should claim that there are millions of people who are against Russia. Even uh, all the polls demonstrated even if you don't like uh, the big figures of the uh, war support, even the worst polls demonstrate that like quarter of the Russians are uh, openly anti-war, anti-Putin. I do believe that's much more than, than a quarter, but quarter of uh, 140 million, it's millions of people. So even millions of immigrated people are a minority from uh, those who are against Putin and who are staying. That is why uh, it's a uh, wishful thinking from the Mr. Putin's side that uh, all the anti-Putin people will emigrate and he will enjoy the quiet and united uh, people. We, uh, it's, it's, it will not going to happen. Thank you. Thank you, Ivan. Um, Mark, regarding uh, protests in Dagestan, I think Dagestan is in a very unique situation where it adds bear the cost of the war very heavily compared to other regions, certainly in the top three in Russia with Chechnya, um, most likely because of the role played by conscription and the role played by military service and social mobility for Dagestan. And in a way also because of the recruitment with contract soldiers after that later in the war. And combined with this, the idea that many people who did their military service in Dagestan would be technically the short list of that limited mobilization. And add to that the idea that in certain city of Dagestan, there was a wave of trying to mobilize everybody. And there are bands who have seen the, the truck going around and saying to every young man to show up at the recruitment office. Um, I think in Dagestan it is, a lot of different factors adding up together that lead to a very strong protest. And again, the way it was answered by the, the Republican government there was very harsh compared to what we've seen in Kabardino Balkaria or the region. So overall, I think it is extremely contextual. It doesn't tell us yet that it will be mobilized. I think the interesting fact about the mobilization political mobilization is the fact that mother and women were extremely active. That's something we have not seen in the past. Uh, when you talk about Chechnya, Chechnya is a strange case. Kedner of launched its own partial mobilization before the federal one. And then when the federal one was uh, launched, people were unhappy. So Kedner of said it will not follow the federal call for mobilization, but continued it. Uh, undercover. So people are still mobilized out of their own uh, camera follow his own pattern. It's simply that he doesn't follow federal rules with regard to the partial mobilization. So I don't think we can say that Chechen is not mobilized right now. It's mobilized by in a camera of approach to war that most likely uh, he decides when and where and from his volunteer battalion from early in the war Kenarov will follow his own way in federal politics and in regional politics. 
With regard to the role of the Chechens in a war, I think we're somewhere in between. They are not TikTok warriors. Let's be very clear on that. They did fight the war in Mariupol. An old picture of the military victory of Chechens with Akhmet Tila with the Akhmet Kadyrov's flag. They did play a role in a lot of urban fighting. At the same time, they do. They are not a military force. They are part of the National Guard. When they were used as a military force, they were useless. They were thugs. They were uh, looting. Uh, they committed war crimes. Um, so we are somewhere in between. They do play a role that raise them to raise their profile higher within the Russian Federation, but they are not a military extraordinary force that will change the, the status of the war. Um, so it is interesting to see the tension between the Russian army, Wagner, the Kalirovsky, and violence within their own rank. Violence can then come back to the North Caucasus or come back to Russia in a couple of months. Um, so depends how you see it. You know, if you follow too much social media, you're missing the war with the Kalirovsky. If you follow too much the war, you're missing the social media. So the Prada boots and all that of Kalirovsky is important. Yes, for sure, there is posing and propaganda. But at the same time, we should be careful not to fall into our own narrative that we want to hear with regard to the war. Uh, we have to take the Kalirovsky seriously, but at the same time, not overblown what they are. Uh, but there's certainly a different pattern. When they fought in Georgia in 2008, nobody talked about that. The Vostok Battalion and other, we didn't really have any information about Chechen leading the way into the Georgian war. We do have a lot of information about them in the Ukrainian war, underlining that the strategic goal within the Russian Federation. With regard to what to do with civil society, it has been extremely weakened. There's still uh, journalism that is pretty strong in the North Caucasus. Human rights organization, not that much. My suggestion, why can't we treat North Caucasian civil society as we do with Ukraine? I see scholarship calls for a PhD student, call for researcher for Ukraine to support uh, scholars at war. But because North Caucasian people are perceived as Russian, they are not perceived as people that need to be supported in terms of the development of civil society, journalism, or research are seen as an avoidance, something that should not be touched with the 10 foot pole. So again, the stigmatization of North Caucasian because they have a Russian passport is at the migration level, it is at the refugee level, it is at the Interpol level, and it is at, in, at the scholar level and the human rights level. So I think we need to do better with regard to the North Caucasus. And um, in a nutshell, that's what I would suggest. Because certainly there's not much that can be done on, on in the North Caucasus right now, especially uh, Russia is closing the borders or limiting Okay, thank you so much for your question. So uh, there is nothing uh, completely new I can add to Ivan Kuleva's uh, answer. So uh, of course the share of those who oppose the war is much bigger, and what we observe in this uh, with these migrants is just the tip of the big iceberg. Again, let me repeat it. So immigration is a privilege, special when it comes to the first two ways of immigration. So this is something that uh, one needs, uh, we need to uh, remember, bear in mind, but also about this healthy cleansing area whatsoever. Um, there is a theory that if all people who are against the regime leave the country, it's technically possible. Unfortunately, it's not, but if it happens. So it will actually uh, help consolidate the political regime and kind of, you know, uh, debilitate the internal uh, domestic opposition to the regime. If we actually forget about Russia and Ukraine for the moment and look at the comparative evidence, uh, because it's not for the first time when they're doing the war, unfortunately. So what the evidence tells us, uh, to the extent we can trust large and analysis, of course, there is a lot of criticism, is that what really works out when talk democratization and regime change is a combination, is a communication between those within the diaspora, as those who are transnational communities, depending on the language you prefer, and those who stay. If these kind of, you know, magic recipe or combination factors is a play, something may come out of that. 
But again, this is not a very common combination, it's not very optimal as when we observe it, because those anti war or pro democratic diaspora or communities they should actually find themselves in democratic states and not being oppressed or suppressed anyhow. If they are, for instance, if they are in Kazakhstan or in Uzbekistan, so to what extent, and Uzbekistani uh, government already asked them, okay, if you behave, we're not going to actually give you away when it comes to people who are uh, supposed to go to work and script it. Again, it's also part of the political repression in, in, in Uzbekistan, or can be used as a political repression. So in this sense, there is a very slight chance of potential democratization like, abroad, although they, these chances are quite slim. So in this sense, this healthy equation is, is not what we're observing, and it's not like you know all good Russians leave them. Uh, we observe. When it comes to the ethnic background, of course, being Russian, especially through anti government, uh, is a kind of a toxic identity. And all those Russian schools, or I mean, proud holders of red passports, they try to find some you know alternative uh, identities like being a Tatar or Jew or someone else. Um, this is why, of course, we included this question in our questionnaire, and we also ask this when we carry out our quality interviews. And uh, that, uh, since Russia is not a national state in the strict sense of the term. Right, so it's just a, if we recall Roman Shparuk's uh, uh, great uh, uh, theory of imperial identities versus ethnic based uh, identities. So, in this sense, this, everything looks much more complicated. So, what I can actually tell for, uh, at the moment is that among those migrants, people actually started recalling their uh, secondary identities so that their grandparents are from Ukraine or they are I mean, from somewhere. This is something that like, people are trying to clean themselves from these toxic identities and actually, you know, kind of trying to restore their dignity from it. So that's what we observe at the moment on the emotional level. This is also something that maybe we need to uh, take into account. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, first up here, and then we'll go back down on that side. And again, if you can just introduce yourself. We've got about seven minutes left, so we get this in one very quick question. Thank you very much. Very much. My name is Nadek Sifdivian. I'm a doctoral student at Virginia Tech School of Public Health and National Affairs. A question for Margarita Zavaska. You touched upon it a little bit, but I wonder if you were asking your sample about their experiences in civil society engagement based on where they are, because um, the political situation is quite different between, let's say, Turkey and Armenia and Georgia and Kazakhstan. How do Russian emigres manage to manifest their um, maybe human rights advocacy or things like that, depending on domestic governments? Thank you. Hi, um, and my question is, uh, sorry, um, I'm Sarah, I am with Freedom House. Um, I had a question for uh, Margarita, um, or was it? Uh, yes, yeah, sorry. <laughs> um, um, how many of the migrants that you, um, that you interviewed, how many of them identified as non-Slavic or part of the LGBTQ community or other minorities? And right behind you. I guess this is all going to Margarita. This is Dan Whippen, um, former Foreign Service, and sometimes I, an adjunct here. Did you mention a third wave coming in December? Um, why December, and how do we know that, and what do we need to know? Thanks. Um, I think one more question up here, and then we'll in the in the booth. Thank you. And I apologize that this question is also to Margarita. I, I really like, uh, uh, to, like, actually struggle with the point that you made about uh, migration being a manifestation of political protest. Uh, so have you considered, um, uh, like, what's your definition of political protest, I would uh, uh, ask, and also have you considered alternative uh, hypotheses like uh, safety and security, even economic, physical, political in the first place. And I didn't introduce myself, apologies. I'm Katarina Shankaruk. I am affiliated with Kiev Mohila Academy. Thank you. Great. Um, Margarita. <laughs> <laughs> I'll try to be brief and less uh, and to the point. So uh, 
Yes, we did ask about the experience of political activists and human rights workers actually was one of the main focus uh, of our research. And basically the repertoire of protests or participation varies dramatically before the migration, after the migration, for obvious reasons, because political environment and degree of repression is quite different. I mean, from Russia versus Georgia, for instance. So uh, of course we would observe more donations, especially to the, I, I mean, uh, Ukrainian army, which is utterly illegal in Russia. So for obvious reasons. And in Georgia, it's possible so when people do that. Of course, we uh, uh, observe some changes that are just, you know, a near function of the very political regime and environment and legal environment they, they, uh, that these migrants actually find, find themselves in. Um, well, I can give you more numbers if you're interested. So we have the across the different countries. Oh, this is something we're still, I, I can't really tell you at the moment because things are quite fresh. So, but yes. If you just send me an email, I'll try to get that. Uh, send you some information on that. How many uh, non Slavic, uh, non ethnic Russian is this? Oh, now the sample is hard to tell, but actually quite a lot. And again, these are numbers is, are, are a bit tricky to interpret because, again, there are, it's really hard to find a single Russian who would say, I'm just a pure Russian, whatever it means, right? So, I mean, it's, it's always a combination. I'm half Jewish, half German. So, and I do have a whole Russian passport. My grandparents are from Ukraine. So, who am I? That's it. <laughs> no, no, who am I? So, that's, yeah, and live in Finland. So, that's, 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 that's absolutely crazy. <laughs> so, uh, how many of them? Actually, much more than I would expect, but also there is a lot of desirability bias. Again, being Russian is not something that people actually are particularly proud of at the moment. So, if these numbers are a bit tricky. Let's see how actually these. Since our data are panel data, we can see how people with self identification changes all the time. So we actually plan to include these questions again after a year or half a year and see are there any changes because it's very likely people do not remember what they said in the first place. Yeah. How many LGBTQI community people? Yes, we do have them. Unfortunately, a rough estimate was less than 10% of our sample. We have about 2,000 people in our first sample, and unfortunately, only 640 people panels uh, respondents in the second wave. Um, not so many, but I think they are much, they are much more of these people. Maybe it's not just the most, you know, important issue for them at the moment. Uh, what about the third wave? I mean, third wave of, of survey, of course, not like, not, not migration, because another wave is, 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 is ongoing. Migratory bird. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's just the, uh, what we, in terms of data collection, sorry for, for confusion. Yeah, I was rushing so much for my, for my numbers that I <laughs> was quite quite unclear. Um, about the reasons for uh, immigration and this, whether we can treat this exit as a protest. So we, here we rely on all the Kirschman's triad for a famous one exit for its loyalty. Um, there is a lot of research actually that comes, that, that is not Russian studies or I mean, not related with areas that is anyhow. And under particularly repressive conditions, immigration can be considered as protest. Because it's, this is something that uh, was actually, this issue was raised by scholars who actually study other like highly consolidated, high capacity authoritarian regimes. So it's something we borrow. It's not like, again, it's, it's really hard to keep a healthy distance and not to kind of, you know, uh, of course, as a Russian citizen, try to find something good in, in this particular very, very bad situation. But on the other hand, uh, it's clearly the fact how these people behave after migration. It's, it, it's obvious that this is a protest. They remain active. They do not disengage, not all of them. There is a category of respondents who do disengage, mostly males and those employed in the IT services, in the IT industry. This is something that uh, actually we're still trying to um, come up with a more comprehensive uh, interpretation. Is it about safety or econ economics? Actually, we asked these questions and then we gave up on that because people actually were indicating all of them. <laughs> and in a sense, it doesn't really make, I mean, uh, I immigrated more than 10 years ago from Russia. Was it for political reasons or was it for economic reasons? It's hard to tell because obviously I want to have bad employment prospects, right? Or I also didn't want to, I, I never supported Putin his government. I, or I, I've been working as an uh, electoral observer monitor for like 15 years. So I've seen all kinds of bad stuff. So was it political economic is hard to tell. So of course I'm not maybe representative because it's a very bad practice to kind of you know, uh, generalize from individual and personal experience. But um, I think it's not even that important. What, what is really important here, what they do. So it's not even what they say, but what they do. So, and what we observe, they volunteer, they're super active. 
they try to build up connections with other civic organizations. Again, not all of them. And hopefully something will come up of them. If nothing happens, well, anyway, they will at least affect labor markets in, in the countries or in, the, in the, the destination. So anyway, it's a relevant topic to, to study, maybe not from in terms of democratization from abroad, but at least in terms of labor market dynamics. So this is maybe the main message to want to speak there. I'm gonna have to, to bring it to a close there. We are, we are out of time. It took an hour and 13 minutes to get to Hirschman. I was wondering. Sorry. No, it's great. Um, so uh, we will reconvene in 15 minutes here uh, in this room to talk about the caucuses north and south, and we will reconvene at the same time, some of us, uh, one floor down to talk about shifting global geopolitics. Um, in the meantime, uh, coffee out there and applause in here, please. Thank <laughs> you.